I'll talk about a number of things today, and, and uh, there's a certain degree of duplication with the Venerable Shijato, but it um, complements it and adds, I hope. Um, so we know that um, early Buddhist texts, so the Buddha, the period of the Buddha is an oral period, so writing isn't used at least until the first century BC. Um, and so texts were composed orally and transmitted orally then for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, even after writing was introduced. Now, these texts were clearly designed with memorization, group recitation, and the faithful transmission of those ideas, those teachings in mind. And these are indicated by two main factors. The first is stylistic features. So this would be the use of formulas. So uh, that is, say, for example, um, the description of the four Brahma Viharas or the Satipatthanas or the Four Noble Truths, wherever they occur in the canon, they're virtually the same wording. Or when you depict a particular event, you use standardised wording. You can vary it according to certain dictates, right? Now, these, this, the actual, particularly early suttas and, and canonical texts, you could almost say that the whole thing is formulaic. Formulas are building blocks that are built up. Um, another feature is uh, repetition. So again, you say, you look at this formula of the four Brahma Viharas, well, you basically have a, a passage which describes how that, you know, you, you project, say, um, mind with loving kindness in the, the different directions, and it has this, that, and that quality, and that's for metta. Uh, and the next one, uh, karuna, uh, karuna uh, mudita and opeka. So the only word that is changed there are the four, the words for the different Brahma Viharas, right? Their word for their verbatim, otherwise, right? So this this is repetition. And when you look, um, this is the topic I looked at in my doctorate. You look at say, very common, just typical sutta. You know, thirty percent of that sutta was a, was verbatim repetitive, and then you have other classes of repetition. So that they're high. I mean, if you've ever read Pali suttas, you can you realize often translators try to brush over it and get rid of the repetition. But you know, repetition is there, a part of the mnemonic of helping uh, monks, nuns remember, transmit that text. Um, another feature is the tendency to build up strings of words, semi-synonymous, semi-synonymous words, and to arrange them according to their syllable length and to have metrical and sound similarity. So you look at this, this occurs in a sutra in the Digha Nikaya, that is the Buddha says to the ascetic Nigrodha, again Nigrodha, an ascetic practices austerities. Because of that austerity, he is intoxicated, infatuated, and careless. So the Pali is sotena, tapasa majjati, mujjati, pama dhamma pajjati, right? So first of all, these majjati, mujjati, pama dhamma pajjati, they're three verbs or verbal phrases, and look at the sound similarity. So first of all, sorry, the, the majjati is three syllables, mujjati is three syllables, the expression pamadama pajjati, seven syllables. So, right, you're increasing in length. And then you look at the sound similarities between in those words, ma, the m sounds, the p sounds, and then the jati, chati, Jati, right? And then you also have metrical similarities. So the first two words have a, a metrical pattern of long, short, short, right? So what does that do? It builds, it builds up a sort of a, a rhythm and, a, and a, a crescendo effect. So all of these features, I think, are very much part of that oral composition. These are deliberate, um, highly structured uh, works that are designed for transmitting the Buddha the teaching of the Buddha and his disciples, right? And to be memorized, to be recited in, in groups and transmitted over long. The reason we have Buddhist texts today, Pali Canon today, is because of features like this and because also of the way the Sangha was set up by the Buddha and the way in which um, you have this continuous tradition of learning, reciting, then when manuscripts are introduced of, of um, copying out texts. Um, sorry, just to go back here. Another feature is that, you know, say the Pali Canon, right? So you, there was a, uh, another oral feature is, and that would ensure the transmission of this material, is to group like 
material into collections. So Digi Nikaya long discourses, uh, Majima middle length discourses, Samyutta Nikaya according to subject matter. And then within that, you start to group the text, smaller textual units according to connection. So a very common feature is you have pairs of, say, within the Agutra and the Samyutta Nikaya, pairs of suttas or threes, and there's a connection of a key word or concept which developed in different ways, right? And you group those into what are called vagas, groups of 10, and then into larger groups and so on, right? And then within that, you have... Um, you have these what are called mnemonic verses or danas at the end of the group of 10 smaller units which take a key word, a concept, a person's name, a place or something and they were recited um, to keep the order and inclusion of what, what actually constituted that group of 10, right? So highly structured again, again uh, on the level of, of the way the collections are put together. Um, we know that the um, different groups of monks were allocated, different groups, uh, sections of the canon or groups of texts. These are called barnikas, and that tradition lasted many hundreds of years. Um, we know, like all religious groups, that you know uh, the, the Buddhist tradition underwent uh, schism, right? And you have different Nikayas, different schools forming. And this happened, you know, both on the basis and often on the basis of behavior, what, you know, how one should behave, whether one you could eat before or after to lunch. Um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes doctrine, not very often, you couldn't be expelled from the, the Sangha for holding a particular view, um, as far as I understand, uh, often from geographical isolation and so on. So, you know, within a short period of time, you know, 100 years onwards particularly, you're getting many different schools, you know, uh, Theravada, the one we all know, Dhammaguptaka, as mentioned before, Savastivadans, Mullahs Savastivadans, Sangitias, Kachapias, Mahasasikas, Mahasangikas, et cetera, et cetera. Many different groups, right? Um, now, none of those have survived except the Theravadans as a practicing tradition, right? The literature has. And even that process continued in Sri Lanka. You know, if you know a little bit about Sri Lankan history, you have the, the, you know, the, the Mahavihara established first by Giri, the Jetavana, and so on. And there was competition there, as there always is for resources among religious groups. And basically, the Mahavihara outcompeted the other groups. And also, there were other non sort of uh, Theravada or, or, or um, Shravakiana groups in Sri Lanka. We have evidence of Mahayana texts and Mahayana groups there, and they were out competed by the Mahavihara. So it was from Sri Lanka and it was from the Mahavihara that Buddhism was transmitted to Southeast Asia. And the Pali Canon that we have today is their version of the Pali Canon. Right? <clears throat> so these are points actually, we sort of came to this independently it seems, these are points for what is unique about the Pali Canon. Well, it's unique and it's the only complete canon of the early schools, one, to have survived, two, in an early Indian language, three, that has been actively and uninterruptedly transmitted to the present day, four, that is augmented by a large body of secondary literature that records how the communities that transmitted understood and regarded the text they transmitted, and five is the object of such statement, statements by contemporary members of the community or school. Now, only a small proportion of the canons of the many other schools that once existed through Buddhism's very long history, you know, spreading over virtually all of Asia, have survived, and they've survived in different languages, Prakrit, um, Gandhari, Sanskrit, Chinese, and Tibetan, right? So what we have is, you know, Buddhists were always very literate. Literature was core and central. And um, as a consequence, you know, they produced a lot of literature, not just the canon, the, the, the amount of, of even in Pali tradition, of Pali literature that's not classed as canonical is huge. And even that is, you know, not everything has survived that, that Theravada communities produced. You know, what we're really looking at, that what has survived, Pali and all these other languages, is the tip of the iceberg. When Buddhism died out of India, virtually the, the vast literature, literature her, literary heritage of those communities disappeared with them. <clears throat> Well, uh, the, is the object of statements. Um, that is, 
Well, we don't only have the, the commentaries themselves and points at different times, but that's coming right up to the current period. And the current Theravada community is engaging with that. It's, it's at your point, I suppose, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basis for practice among yep, living communities. <clears throat> Now, the earliest uh, literary account we have of the use of writing in Buddhist traditions uh, is the first century BC, and that occurs in the, the famous um, uh, Pali chronicle in Sri Lanka, the Deepavamsa, re repeated in the Mahavamsa. Um, it's only two verses, it's very short, and this is under King uh, Vatagamini Abhaya. Um, due to some uh, fear that the canon was going to be lost, that the, uh, the canonical texts and the commentaries, which were uh, traditionally transmitted orally, committed to writing. That's the only record we have. Um, Pali manuscripts, however, now, as you know, Sri Lanka, many of you from Sri Lanka or Southeast Asia, it's a pretty hot place. Manuscripts don't last very long there. There's bugs and things to eat them, right? Most editions we have of Pali texts are based on 18th century, at least in earliest. You know, a uh, uh, manuscript that uh, Venerable Sajjad is very interested in, 13th century, that's ancient and, uh, and unique, right? Pretty rare. There's four or five manuscripts dating from that period that have survived. The oldest, oldest Buddhist manuscripts we have have been surfacing in the last 20 years, and that's uh, from this region here, which is northern Afghanistan, I'm sorry, eastern Afghanistan and northern Pakistan. It's in antiquity, it was called Gandhara. Um, it was an area the Greeks had, the Persians and then the Greeks and many peoples had conquered it. The artwork of this region is famous because it, you see a, a very rich, you know, meeting of, you know, Hellenistic features, um, Mediterranean features, Indian, Central Asian and so on. Um, so these manuscripts date to the first century BC to, and this is based on carbon dating and paleographic features and so on, to the third century, fourth century of the Common Era. So the first to turn up is this one. I'll just, I won't talk too much about this. This is, uh, these were manuscripts that were turned up in the Peshawar Museum, uh, Peshawar Bazaar, found their way into the antiquities market, ended up in the British Library. This is um, in a pot, these are birch bark, right? So I've had some of them carbon dated here first century AD, but some of them, for other reasons, we have some of the dates go back to first century BC. So this, these are the oldest Buddhist and the oldest Indian manuscripts we have. This is taking us much, much closer to the period of the Buddha than anything else we have, right? So, you know, it, it, you know it's quite a, now we're looking at hundreds of manuscripts. I've just been in Pakistan trying to secure a home for a new collection that's turned up um, and, you know, there's some 60 odd manuscripts in this. I don't know how many texts. Um, you know, this is so really many. Um, great diversity of genres, you know, canonical, what would correspond to Pali canonical texts, commentaries, Abhidharma texts, Mahayana texts as well, later the whole gamut, right? Um, uh, we then have manuscripts that are turned up in Bamiyan when caves were destroyed there. These are in the, the earliest ones, the top one in this Gandhari is very a language that's closely related to Pali. It's a little bit linguistically more modern. Um, and uh, Sanskrit manuscripts, which are actually later because Sanskrit became uh, an important language of uh, intellectual discourse and so on. Um, uh, the Venerable talked about the Gilgit manuscripts. These are yet another collection of Gilgit manuscripts that turned up in the antiquity markets that found their way to, pack to America recently. Um, you know, these are 7th, 8th century, right? So these are taking us back, manuscript-wise at least, before virtually most anything we have in, in Pali. So a lot of my work is I'm editing these, these Gandhari texts um, and publishing them. And a lot of it is comparing it with, say, the Pali version, because we have such a fantastic corpus of, you know, of, of uh, whole literature or Sanskrit, Chinese or whatever. Um, now, when you compare, you know, parallel versions, let's just stay with canonical texts at the moment, sutta, sutras, right? So whole episodes in one version are not found in another and vice versa, right? Um, 
uh, you'll find, say, episodes arranged in different, uh, different arrangement of events, different arrangement of information within the description of event or concept, inclusion or omission of information or information about the same event differing, tendency for the Sanskrit and to some extent the Gandhari to expand the lists and expand the details and descriptions more generally and generally give more information. They've been improved, in other words, right? Um, different personal and place names, different words used, for example, synonyms, right? In one area, you use the word for, a, say, a hole in a, in a yoke is one word, and in Gandhar, it's a different one, so you change words like that. Um, importance, difference of grammar, etc. cetera. So um, uh, I think the Venerable Sajada would agree is that when you start comparing them, there are all these differences, but doctrinally, they're the same, that you don't really get the differences between the schools in terms of doctrine and vinaya don't really show up in the suttas for the most part, but I think we need to start looking at a more subtle level, right? So an example would be the very last words of the Buddha, right? And I'm just comparing two traditions now, right? So the first one would be the Pali, which is the, uh, the, the narrator says, then the Bhagavat addressed the monks. And the Buddha says, monks, I will now address you. It is the nature of formations to disappear. Strive diligently. And the narrator picks up, this was the last speech of the Tathagata. So that's a very short speech. The Sanskrit version belonging to a school called the, the uh, Savastivadans, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it is, but and you can see the differences in bold. This is, however, to be done by Tathagata since he has compassion on later generations. Then the Bhagavat turned aside his upper robe from his own body, addressed the monks, gaze upon the body of a Tathagata, gaze closely upon the body of a Tathagata. What is the reason for this? Because the sight of a Tathagata Arahat, completely enlightened one, is difficult to gain, just as a flower of a fig tree. Monks, please be silent. It is the nature of all formations to disappear. This was then the last speech of the Tathagata. Right? Now, in terms of ideas, you know, doctrine, it's, there's no difference. But the description is more complex. And the question is, well, why? why? Why would you change that? Well, one possibility is that this, the, the editors of this version were facing a tendency in, in Buddhist communities to increasingly deify the Buddha. And that this was to emphasize the fact that the Buddha, in this school at least, was a human being and he was 80 years old and his body was falling to pieces. Right. Um, that's just one possibility. Um, you know, I told you about the tendency to, to create lists, right? So when the Buddha is just about to die, the malas of the, where, the, the town where he's dying come and Ananda introduces the head of the household and says, this is so-and-so with his sons, wives, retinue, friends. Now the Sanskrit is, uh, and this is just one of many versions, with his sons, wives, male and female slaves, servants, laborers, friends, companions, relatives and kinsmen, right? So it's expanded, hasn't changed the meaning much, just it's, it's beautified it actually. It's an improvement, you could say, right? Now, interesting, an interesting divergence is that sometimes that wording is actually found in Pali elsewhere. Or, you know, when you, trans, you transmit from one language to another, you often find difficulties. So this is just one verse from the Dhammapada, and I'll just compare the very first two uh, putters, that is, dwelling, contemplating, pleasant things, being controlled in the senses, right, of this verse. It occurs, there's several, ver many versions, Pali, Prakrit, Gandhari, and Sanskrit, right? So when, if you convert Pali into Sanskrit, metrically it doesn't work, right, because of the sound system. So the editors of this had to change things, right? So first of all, Subhano Darshinam, is one extra syllable compared to the Pali. So we couldn't have the word viharatam, which is redundant anyway, so they've got the word permanently. So again, it doesn't change that much in meaning, but it's a change in, in, in wording. Um, again would be, say, when a monk approaches the Buddha, the Pali is, then he approached the Buddha, having approached, he paid homage to the Bhagavad, and he sat down to one side. Well, the Sanskrit, and through all of the non-Pali traditions, it's normally he approached, having approached, he honoured the feet of the Bhagavata with his head and sat down to one side. And the Gandhari versions mirror this, right? So what this is, is this word Abhivadetva paid respect with his head at the feet. This was obscure by, at a certain time, and the gloss that to clarify exactly what that action entailed was introduced, so the wording became standard across the, all of the, the um, other traditions. Um, here you have the say, 
a very famous sutta, the Samanyapala Sutta, the second sutta, the Digni Nikaya. It depicts King Ajatasattu, had King Di killed his father, Ajatas uh, Bimbisara, um, uh, who was a follower of the Buddha. And he decides, you know, he asks his courtiers on a full moon night, who, what should I do on a full moon night? Which court, which monk should I visit, religious person? And uh, in the Pali, it's very simple. Unnamed ministers recommends the six heretical teachers. But by the, when we, uh, we see this narrative introduction, and then he, he, he sees his physician next to him, he says, why are you silent, Jivika? And Jivika says, well, the Buddha's nearby, we should go and visit him. And so the king decides, and f in fear and trepidation, he goes, he goes and sees the Buddha. He doesn't recognize him, which is the Buddha. And he then he sees the, the monks peaceful and calm, and he says, well, I wish I had my son, who is Udai, who actually ends up killing him, would be as peaceful of the, as the Buddha, right? That's the simplest version of the Pali. By the time we get to Gandhari now, the Gandhari manuscript predates first century anything preserved in Pali. So you can see a disjunct between manuscript and text, right? It is the most complex narrative introduction. That is, first of all, the king asks his, his um, non-ministerial uh, retinue the queens and so on, what should we do? And the queens all recommend, oh, let's go up to the top of the palace and play music and you know dance. And then the, 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 the general of the army says, well, let's parade the army around the, the city wall. And the prince says, well, let's go off and beat up our neighbors. And, and it goes on like this. And then it's real, there's just this complex narrative introduction, right? So, um, you know, these, this text survives in many different languages and versions, and it's depicted in art, say, at, at Barhut. Um, another one is the Anattalakana Sutta, very famous. It's the second discourse of the Buddha, right, um, after the Dhammachaka Bhavatana Sutta. It's preserved in many different languages and different forms. Um, the Gandhari version I'm just editing at the moment, um, so it you know, has this common structure that is, uh, they all are very, very similar, all the versions, right? Um, but it's basically the Buddha emphasizing that there's nothing of this being that is permanent, right? And that what's permanent is suffering and you shouldn't regard as oneself, what you shouldn't regard as oneself. So when you start looking at, say, the Pali, well, I'll let you read it out there, I won't read it out, but um, it's, it's identical with the, the surviving Gandhari version, right? This is the words of the Buddha. Um, when we look at the Sanskrit ever, it's slightly different, actually quite different, but doctrinally in terms of teaching, it's not different, right? Still the same gist, that is, everything's impermanent, don't cling to it, uh, regard it all as not self. Um, so a detailed study of the wording, structure, and parallel versions of early Buddhist texts preserved in Pali, Gandhari, Prakrit, Sanskrit, Chinese, and Tibetan shows that the Pali texts tend to be the most conservative, right? Descriptions are briefer, lists are shorter, the words, uh, the wording less expanded than the Gandhari and Sanskrit, plots are uh, less complex, and so on. So in certain aspects, the wording of at least uh, Pali versions of canonical sutta texts um, and the verses are earlier. This re sort of reinforced what uh, Venerable Stjata said, which is in keeping with the language itself, Pali being the earliest Prakrit we have um, than the other versions. So, you know, but we can't then, you know, as the Venerable sort of hinted at, we can't thereby say that the Pali is, you know, with this doesn't necessarily match on to authenticity in the sense that you can't say that the Sanskrit version uh, or the Pali version is more authentic than the Sanskrit version. Because you see a lot of the, 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 the changes, they are literary improvements, right? And doctrinally, they don't make a lot of difference, right? Um, but, uh, you know, there was a tendency to prioritize the Pali as the oldest and most authentic Pali uh, text, Buddhist text, for all the reasons we've outlined, that is true to a certain extent, but it's immensely important that we take into consideration these other parallel versions and are lucky to have them. Um, as I said, writing was used from about the first century onwards, so we have an immensely rich um, literary culture and preserved within the Pali tradition, even things like this Sanskrit singular Bhakti Shataka, um, 19th century manuscript. Um, the first printed uh, books were in Asia, that is 1893, this Thai version, 
um, and then you have more recently the uh, the Burmese Chattasangayana, the Buddha uh, Janti editions and printed other editions in Sri Lanka, Pali Text Society editions from 1881 onwards, um, and then we move into electronic age. So right, CD-ROMs. Um, you know, the, the Thai version, the Burmese version, the Burmese version now electronically, you know, on the internet. Um, Sudha Central, you've seen, you know, all about that, um, which also gives you then access to the parallels, either in the primary text or, or both in translations. And then, say, with the Gandhari text I'm working on, we have this platform called Read, and we, we're mounting this material, uh, making it accessible, um, where we produce grammars and, and studies. Um, so throughout Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, there are big re repositories of manuscripts dating from various periods, Pali manuscripts. We'll just stick with the Pali for the moment. Like this one in Burma, um, here in the National Library in um, Yangon, um, uh, Fragile Leaf Burmese manuscripts in Bangkok, um, started by Peter Skilling, um, all very nicely. So this is being now uh, catalogued, scanned, and made freely available, right, this material. There are many different projects to digitize manuscripts through Southeast Asia. Um, so Laotian manuscripts, where you can download scans like this, they're microfilms, um, Cambodian manuscripts, um, uh, Northern Thai Lana manuscripts, important early manuscript tradition in Thailand. In Sri Lanka, the Thai group, the Dhamma, uh, Dhammakaya, were photographing manuscripts, mostly canonical texts, and they were working closely with this group. Um, I actually um, got con was contacted by a Mr. Ranasinghe, who was heading this project and wanted to do a doctorate on this, I sort of lost track of him, but this is all I could really find about the current state of this project, right? They have a Facebook presence, a research gate presence and so on. So they seem to be um, trying to preserve manuscripts, scan them, but I don't see anywhere where you can download, access these manuscripts. So now to connect with the Memory of the World UNESCO project, which is sort of the core of this meeting, which is, a project that I'm involved in is in uh, Mandalay, that is in sort of the center of, of Burma, Man, uh, Myanmar. Um, in the uh, late 1800s, 1860 to 1865, the second last king of Burma, King Mindon, had the whole of the Pali Canon carved on 729 marble slabs in the Burmese script, right? So this is very important. It's pre Western editorial traditions, right? Um, that you're looking at the biggest one is the canon. The one on the smaller one is Sandamuni. This is the commentary so that was produced some years later. There's King Mindon. Um, this is at a time when the British had just conquered southern Burma, 1855. So this is a Buddhist king who is trying to preserve the Dhamma. This was unprecedented. You know, it was a normal thing for, for kings throughout the Buddhist world, Sri Lanka included, to have copies of the Tripitaka uh, produced on palm leaf manuscript and distributed, like this one, which was produced by King Mindon's father, the previous king, and donated to the British representative at that time. So I think that the conquering of southern Burma by the British was an incentive for King Mindon to produce this site. Um, these are the, the examples. Um, at that time. Uh, they're beautiful things. They're each one in a little pagoda like this. Um, you know, you have here, you have donor inscriptions which record that they're, uh, you know, they were re-inked and cleaned and so on. The pagoda's whitewashed and the, the, the little chatras the, um, produced on top. Um, this is considered to be the world's biggest book by the Burmese, um, you know, physically well uh, it is in terms of space, um, and at its core is a pagoda like most sites. It is a functioning, highly revered religious site in Burma. Um, it's, you know, every Sunday or whatever day, you have monks coming and giving sermons underneath the, the starflower trees, which were actually planted by King Mindon. 
And it's the model for many other similar sites throughout Southeast Burma and Southeast Asia, such as this one, which was produced in 1957, just outside Bangkok, which has the whole of the Pali Canon in Thai script this time. Um, as a consequence of all of those above things, the significance of it, it was in 2013 made a memory of the world. Um, now, that's an interesting thing because I went there in 2014 with one of my students and it was a bit of a mess. So I think that UNESCO had never actually been there. So the outer areas definitely, you know, it was like what you see here. There was graffiti, people when they whitewashed, they didn't cover the slabs, there was rubbish, it was just in a mess, the, the doors were broken, right? So myself and some colleagues from Nantian Institute and one of my students, uh, we raised money from a Japanese donor to, to clean photograph, so here we brought the University of Sydney conservator to train local conservators with the Department of Archaeology to clean these slabs and to photograph them. So we produced high quality photographs of this whole corpus, right, using local, uh, very highly skilled photographers, etc. And now what we're doing is working with Sidhu Saidor, um, a famous Burmese monk, to produce a transliteration of the whole because it's Pali language, it's in Burmese script, not many people can read that. So what we want to do is mount the whole lot on the internet so you can access um, here, what we, this is again within this read platform. So you have the text and as you scroll down, um, the, the actual uh, um, uh, Stella itself, the, the Pali text will scroll with it, right? And then we'll try to do some other things that will make that available. Um, okay, so to conclude then, um, Pali literature in general, which is a vast body of literature, many times greater than the volume of the canon itself, um, witnesses a long history, vibrancy and creativity of the Theravada tradition, um, a tradition that has provided the foundation for the intellectual, spiritual and cultural life of much of South and Southeast Asia for most of the historical period of these lands. Now, many of these texts, so this is now expanding beyond the canon, are very little known, if, if not at all. Um, manuscripts preserve readings, so manuscripts are very important. They preserve readings that are not, uh, that often differ in ways that I've just illustrated when you compare, say, the not quite as radical, but be, when you compare, say, a Gandhari or a, a Pali version, um, readings that are important that the standard published editions don't, don't preserve. Um, an example was, say, there's a Pali sutta called the Dharukanda Sutta, that is the Buddha um, is near the river Ganga and a monk comes and asks him for a teaching and, um, uh, he sees a log floating down the river and he says, well, if, if that log flows on, doesn't get caught on this bank, that bank, or on a, on a sandbar, it'll flow to the river. And if the same way, if a monk doesn't get caught on these, you know, by the sense, in, internal sense faculty, et cetera, you'll end up in Nibbana if you practice properly. Well, the place name there is um, in the Gandhari Zayodhya. In the standard edition of the Pali, it's different, but in fact, of the canon, but in fact, in some variant readings within the Pali tradition, you actually get the word Ayodhya, right? So somehow this, this place name was preserved in the, the greater um, Buddhist tradition. So it also, um, uh, manuscripts preserve are witnesses to the transmission, the complex transmission history of Pali texts throughout Asia, right? So as the Venerable Shijata said, Pali and Buddhist you know, Pali-based Buddhism was transmitted up to Southeast Asia, Burma, Thailand, etc., and there was a constant cross-fertilization. There were periods of trauma in Sri Lanka when things were not doing very well, and the king invited monks from Thailand or Burma to bring and manuscripts. So you have, you know, quite quite a number of Burmese manuscripts or Thai manuscripts in Sri Lanka, and sometimes Sri Lankan lineages, which had their ordination lineage in Sri Lanka were copying, sorry, in, in Burma or Thailand, were copying manuscripts that were originally in those scripts and preserving the readings of those traditions, right? So this complex history of the transmission of Pali literature needs to be sorted out. Manuscripts is one of the ways you do that. Um, now, um, there are important manuscript collections, as I said, in monasteries and public libraries and private hands. And many of these are not in good condition, right? Um, you saw some pictures before and deteriorating. I could only find one 
uh, project to scan manuscripts in Sri Lanka. And even then, I don't find that they've been made available publicly, um, though they might have plans. Um, uh, now, this is a huge, you know, that with given the climate of Sri Lanka and other things, this is a huge loss. It's a huge loss. Um, uh, you know, were, were they to be continued to be neglected, a loss uh, to Sri Lanka's rich cultural, intellectual, and religious history. So, you know, memory of the world, that's one thing. Memory of the world, UNESCO status, doesn't actually give you money. What it gives you is a status that you can leverage to raise money to do things. Right, um, but uh, to to my idea, the say the Kudra or Pagoda site or others, mostly they're physical things, right? So Gilgit manuscripts, physical manuscript collection, uh, Kudra it's a physical place, um, uh, and so on. Uh, to the Tripitaka itself, I don't know how that's going to work, but. Manuscript collections in, a, say, a monastery that has a particularly important collection or a series of manuscripts and so on, I would have thought that that's the basis for um, memory of the, the, the world status. Um, whether or not, you know, the Sri Lankan government gets that up and running, what is a desideratum is the preservation of these manuscripts, the collections, and that, you know, these vast collections, important collections, and the you know, given the digital age, the preservation through digital means. Thank you. Thank you.